Well, good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, hold your spot there. If you're here this morning and you do not have a Bible, there is a Bible in the pew rack in front of you, and we would ask that you would take that and make that your own as a gift from us to you. We value and covet the Word of God and want to give that as a gift to you. So hold your spot there in Matthew chapter 20 as we have a a Thanksgiving sermon, one that forces us to really presses us in a pretty challenging way, if we're honest, what Jesus is going to do today uh, to rely on God as our portion. Peter went back to fishing because it's all he knew. You see, he was filled with unbearable guilt after denying Jesus three times that he didn't know what else to do. So he went back to fishing. And then one morning, Jesus came along. The resurrected Christ came and met him along the shoreline and actually cooked for him breakfast around a charcoal fire. Jesus was very strategic about the scene, you see, because Peter had denied Jesus three times at Caiaphas' house around a charcoal fire. And there along the shoreline, Jesus recreates a charcoal fire, but this time he will look at Peter and three times he will ask, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. You see, Jesus is restoring Peter. Peter is visibly moved by the third time because he remembers that he called down curses upon himself as he denied Christ for the third time, and now Jesus restores him. The scene is beautiful. Jesus then looks at Peter and says, hey, Peter, when you were younger, you used to go wherever you wished to go. But now that you are old, you will be bound and go where you do not wish to go, signifying the death that Peter was going to have. And then Jesus looks at him and says, follow me. The same commands that Jesus had told Peter when he first found him along the shoreline, he repeats them. This entire scene is poetic. It is moving. It is captivating. And then it all comes to an abrupt halt. Just like that. It it, it feels like the force of a ton of bricks uh, falls because Peter turns, sees John, and says, well, what about him? What's going to happen to him? How do you think Jesus is going to take that? He simply says, what is that to you? If I want him to live till he's a million, it doesn't matter. You follow me. Church, let's pause for a moment and let's get real about the way that comparison is the thief of our joy. Taking our eyes off our situation and what God wants to do with us and playing the that's not fair game about what God's doing in other people's lives. Your friend gets a new car but you can't find joy for them because all you can think about is your 11-year-old clunker comparison. You get passed over for a promotion at work by someone with less seniority. It says if no one notices the sacrifices that you are making to make everything run smoothly, your sister gets pregnant the moment that they get off birth control. And all you can do is sit in silence because you've been trying for years. Comparison. Your son is severely autistic and will never live a normal life. While the neighbor across the street has seven healthy kids. 
Your husband drinks too much and won't take any spiritual leadership within the home while your best friend has a model husband. Comparison. Where all I can see is the blessing of your situation versus the obstacles and pain of my situation and determine that God and life are simply not fair. In this morning's passage, Jesus will speak directly to this tendency in our lives. And if we are willing to listen, he will lead our hearts to peace. So you ask yourself right now, if God speaks, will you allow him to lead your heart to peace? Matthew chapter 20, listen as I read the first 16 verses. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when they had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right I will give to you. And so they went. Again, he went out in the sixth hour and the ninth hour, and he did the same. And about the 11th hour, when he came out and he found others still standing around, and he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, because no one has hired us. So he said to them, you go out into, into the vineyard too. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more. But to each one of them, they also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner saying, these last men have worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Uh, did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But, I, but if I wish to give the last man the same as you, it is not lawful for me to do so if I wish that which is my own. For is your eye envious because I am generous? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, would you give us ears to hear? Father, we do confess how often we are distracted, chasing so many things of this world that are ultimately not ours to chase. We need your Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning with a profoundness always drawing our heart back to the truth that you are our portion. You are our portion. May our hearts ring with contentment as we are satisfied with you. We pray all of that in Jesus' name, amen. Now, the context of this parable that Jesus tells is incredibly important. You have to put it in its context. Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem. That is where he is going. The triumphal entry is right around the corner. The rich young ruler has just approached him. By the way, someone that the disciples were very, very excited about, thinking this is someone that we need on our team. And yet Jesus' words were too much for the rich young ruler. And so he self-selects out. And then Jesus warns about the difficulty of entering heaven when earthly riches capture our eye. 
Now, this is shocking to the disciples because they think that they're going to Jerusalem to overthrow the Romans, and they are about to be in the courtyard of the king, right? They're going to have prominent positions. They think they are about to be an incredible authority. Immediately after Jesus tells this parable, he tells them, I'm going to Jerusalem to die on a cross. But they don't hear it. They don't hear it. All they are thinking about is the, is the rewards that they think are coming right here, right now, in this life. So that's their mindset. They're thinking, we're following the right path. All things are about to get really, really good for us. It's why they're shocked when Jesus warns about wealth. And so in 1927, right before this parable, Peter asked Jesus, he says, hey, we've left everything in order to follow you. What will be in this for us? Now, Jesus tells them, you got to pay attention to this, in the regeneration Okay? When I make all things right and new in heaven, it's going to be greater than you could ever imagine. Okay? You guys are going to be sitting on 12 thrones and you're going to be judging the tribes of Israel. It's going to be great. But he tells them this parable to ground them. Okay? Because life before the end will not seem fair. It will not seem fair, especially for the disciples. Every one of them will be martyred except for John, who spends the remainder of his days exiled on the island of Patmos. Now, they can't hear because they're so busy jockeying for things and position. And I pray that's not us this morning. Because it has been written for us so that we may hear. And he tells a a parable, a story about tangible things in life to teach us a spiritual truth. Now, don't get caught up in over-spiritualizing every movement of a parable. Just understand the overall movement. And here, you need to know that God is the landowner. All right, so what are the details as we walk through Jesus' parable? It's harvest time. And the landowner of a vineyard needs to hire extra day laborers to gather the crop before it spoils on the vine. So what does he do? He goes to the town market where day laborers would gather. You see, the majority of day laborers would be the poor. Those who do not have their own land, sometimes they're even the homeless, all right? A group that's not always looked upon with the most respect. Life has dealt many of them a difficult hand, and others have made poor choices. The landowner begins early in the morning, presumably 6 a.m., and hires workers for his vineyard. Now, you got to picture the scene because it's filled with noise and chaos. There are many workers piled there in the courtyard, and there are other landowners there too. And, and, and people are wanting to get picked for work that day, right? They need this job. And so if you're a, a landowner that shows up, you know, always the strongest The best workers get picked early in the morning because you've got a job to do. And then, of course, they settle on the price of a day's work. Up front, a denarius, that would be an appropriate amount for one day's wage. During harvest season, a person would work for 12 hours, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., and they would get paid at the end of the day. Now, a day laborer lived from day to day. A denarius was only enough to feed your family. 
It, it wasn't enough to save or get rich on or anything like that. It's just enough to get by. So every one of these day laborers desperately needed this work. Now at 9 a.m., your Bible says the third hour. That's because the Jews counted time starting at sunrise, 6 a.m. So it says the third hour. So at 9 a.m., the owner goes back to the market. It actually doesn't tell us why he goes back. Let's, let's assume that, that his wife sent him on an errand. Okay? He goes back to the market and he sees that there are other laborers who didn't get picked up at 6 a.m. in that morning rush. And he feels compassion on them. Now I'm going to tell you why in a second why you need to read the story this way. And so he hires another group of workers. He says, go into my vineyard. They do not settle on a price, but rather he simply says, you work all day and whatever is right, I'll give to you. You see, at 9 a.m., there's still hope of getting picked up for work that day. But as each hour goes by, your hope diminishes. This landowner is obviously concerned because he goes back at 9 a.m., at noon, at 3 p.m., and then again at 5 p.m., picking up more workers every time he goes back. So here's your decision as you're reading and listening to the story. Either he's a complete dolt of a landowner and can't figure out how many laborers he needs, and he's just a buffoon that's like, oh, I guess I need a couple more. Or, you see, every time he goes back home, he has a burning image in his mind of workers that are still waiting in the town square who aren't going to be able to feed their family that day. And so he goes back. And he goes back. And he goes back. All the way up until 5 p.m. Okay? With only one hour left in the day. And he just says to them, whatever is right, I'll give you. That's all he agrees to. Whatever is right, I'll give you. So now, the end of the day comes. It's 6 p.m., and it's time to pay the workers. The landowner sends out the foreman, okay, to pay them, but he intentionally starts with the last group. Now, he does that. That is an intentional movement in the entire parable, and he's teaching the disciples something in this. So he starts with the last group so that everyone is circled around and watching him pay. The last group worked one hour. All they've agreed to, whatever is right. But they can't feed their family on fractions. And so in abundant generosity, they are given a full day's wage. Seeing this, the first group's eyes get really big. The story shifts to allow you to understand their thought process of the first group. The ones that were hired at the very beginning of the day. Now, by the way, this first group, how grateful do you think they were at 6.05 that morning? Okay? In that chaotic labor pool as they were picked out, they knew all day that their family would be fed, that that day was going to be a good day. But rather than rejoicing in the generosity given to the last group, Rather than being thankful and content with the security that they had all day, their eyes got big because they assume 
what must be coming. You see, they assume. Let's just stop right there. Because if comparison is the thief of joy, she has a sister named Assume. There's so much in our lives that we take for granted in assumption. We assume the stock market will go up so that we will be able to retire in comfort. We assume prosperity and freedom. That our careers will catapult and they'll be so fulfilling. We assume that we will live to 70, 80, that we will grow old with our spouse. We assume we will outlive our kids. We assume that we will have the ability to have kids and grandkids and live healthy, pain-free, comfortable lives. And the more prosperous we've become, the more we assume we deserve. And the more disappointed and depressed we've become. Church, we've got to get real here for a moment because Jesus presses us with a difficult truth because he's trying to lead our hearts. He's trying to ground the disciples about the fact that life is filled with uncertainty and to guard us against assumptions and comparison because assumptions and comparison rob our heart of thankfulness. Amen? Amen? They rob our heart of thankfulness. Now, because this first group's expectations have changed, right? Their expectations have changed. Now that they receive their daily's wage, they're highly disappointed. Gone are the feelings of gratitude and thankfulness all throughout the day because they were chosen early, because they had the security of working all day. And now those feelings have been replaced with bitterness of comparison and the old refrain, that's not fair. And all they can think about is their pain and the sweat and the heat of the day and how the final group came in at the cool of the evening. It was easy for them, and they only worked one hour. And they got equal pay? That's not fair. They are so disgruntled that they way overstep their cultural bounds. Okay? They make sure the landowner knows that they're upset. Okay? Obviously, this would cost them being hired again in the future. And in fact, they go so far, they don't even give a proper title to the landowner. They are disgruntled. And apparently, one of them has been a little more vocal than the others, because in verse 13, he is addressed specifically. Friend. That's how the landowner addresses him. Friend. How's that for a kind, gentle title for someone behaving out of turn. Friend, I have done you no wrong. We agreed on a denarius. That is fair. That is a just wage for you. What you are objecting to, what you think is not fair about life, is my generosity to another. But I'm the landowner. It's all mine. I can do what I want with it. Look at verse 15. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? The Greek here translated envious eye literally means evil eye. It's an idiom that we translate for jealousy, but it literally means evil eye. Is your eye evil because I am generous? 
You know, it's quite possible that the last workers were the least desirable. I mean, that's only natural selection, right? The landowner's pay scale is terrible for business. It's terrible for the bottom line. He's not going to make that much money this way. But that's the point. God is generous. But is our eye evil? Are we jealous because God is generous somewhere else? You see, but he's God. He's the landowner. He owns it all. He can do what he wishes. Furthermore, he doesn't owe us anything. He can never be accused of being unjust for none of us have gotten what we fully deserve. You see, all of our uh, objections of fairness as, as far as what we think is right to us are nothing more than jealousy over God's generosity for someone else. And Jesus is grounding his disciples who are expecting heaven's rewards now. But they're about to endure persecution Intense, be killed, and there will be disappointment on this earth. In the end, all will be made right. But if you and I go through this life looking through the lens of comparison and assumptions, friend, that's poison. It will steal your peace and your joy. Because the fact that anyone was hired is all grace. To borrow from another parable of Jesus in, in Matthew 18, your debt, your sins before the king is more than 150,000 years worth of work. Jesus is giving a hyperbolic uh, expression in today's terms saying you owe God $50 billion worth of sins. A debt you could never repay. You see, there's no room for envious comparison in the kingdom of heaven because it's all grace. Whether you come in early, middle, or late in life, it's all grace. It's all grace, church. So the key to applying the parable is one, let God be God in other people's lives, okay? You let God be God to them. Two, rejoice in generosity that's given to others, especially when they are the most vile and and least deserving, okay? When they come to faith in Jesus, we should overflow in joy that God could save such a wretch like me. And third, you and I are called to be thankful. You and I are called to understand that God is our portion. Think about that. It's one of the most magnificent phrases in all of Scripture that will lead your heart to contentment, okay? God is your portion, right? You are sitting at the dinner table. Your brother or your sister, they got a larger portion. They got a little more uh, uh, sweet potato casserole. And, and all you do is whine and complain about what's on the other plate. And God says, I am your portion. I am on your plate. Stop being so distracted and be satisfied with me. In fact, I will give you more and more and more of myself if you would actually desire it. Okay? You you can never get enough of him. You have all of him that you actually desire. He is your portion. Is his grace not sufficient for you? then why do we spend so much time comparing and comparing and not being content? 
Rather, our mind should be filled with thanksgiving because the Lord is my portion. His grace is sufficient for me. Peter was restored by the resurrected Jesus on the shoreline. After Jesus poetically recreated a charcoal fire and asked him three times, do you love me? But all of that vanished when Peter took his eyes off Jesus, looked at John and said, well, what about him? Now, the good news is that Peter didn't stay in that comparison trap. When you read the two letters that are in the New Testament from Peter, the tone has changed. There's a lot of maturity that's there. In fact, the whole letter of 1 Peter is about embracing your trials, understanding that your trials prove that you have real faith, and that is worth more than anything this world could ever offer. But in 2 Peter, Peter's bound in chains. And Jesus has told him, 2 Peter chapter 1, that he's about to die. He knows the end has come. Does Peter in that moment say, wait, 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 that's not fair. What about John? How old's John? Is he going to still live? He doesn't do any of that. All of that is past. And you get this incredible response where Peter, in his final days, he just wants to write the church encouragement so that they remember long after he's gone everything that he's tried to teach them. Because he knows he's about to get the reward of his faith. He's about to go to the one that he has longed to be with, that he hasn't seen for 30 plus years. Now he gets to see him again face to face. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's this incredible resolve and contentment as Peter's end nears. Church history tells us that Peter refused to be crucified in the same position as his Lord and Savior. And so he told them, crucify me upside down, for I am not worthy. He happily lays down his life, but he says, I am not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as my Lord. Contentment. Because the Lord is our portion and his grace is sufficient. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we love your word. I thank you that, that Jesus presses his disciples and us with this incredible parable about not fixing our eyes on what you are doing in other people's lives, but rather to fix our eyes upon you. Help us to do that. Help us to drink in your grace. Help us to be satisfied and content in you and to trust you. We, we say that to you right now, Jesus. We trust you. And we trust what you are doing in our lives. Have your way with us. Transform us into the image of you, Jesus. Forgive us when we become so easily distracted. And even in the deep things of life, where there's deep loss of loved ones, of trials like infertility and health issues. Jesus, help, help us to give those to you, to 
find contentment in you. And we will know we are content when we are able to rejoice in the generosity that you give to others. We pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen.